Salutations, mortals. This is Oaken, published poet, creative entrepreneur, but most importantly, host of the From the Jump podcast. From the Jump is a podcast mainly focusing on the humanization of creatives to their respective and or potential audiences through honest, unscripted, and unfiltered conversations with another creative, the host. So let us be your entry point to this exciting journey. But first, we'd like to give a special shout out to the Sounds of the World podcast, hosted by Hillary and William, for serving us a feast of in-depth global interactions of music around the globe. Welcome to the Sounds of the World. We are your hosts, Hillary and Bill. Together, we're going to travel around the world to discover new music, discuss musical topics, and interview fascinating people. Our world is a buffet of music, and it is time to eat. Today, we have a very special guest here. She's a music composer, conductor, and teacher originally from Indiana. She just finished her PhD at LSU or Louisiana State University where she studied with the renowned Greek-American composer Dinos Konstantinidis, LSU Boyd Professor of Composition. After finishing her PhD, she moved back to Indiana to be near her family and will be serving as adjunct instructor at Kentucky Wesleyan College. Today, we're going to talk to her about her life, her music, and her doctoral document. Nevertheless, she composed a contemporary survey of women composers of the 21st century. That compiles biographical interviews with living female composers that we are sure will be invaluable to the future of classical music. So please welcome Liz Knox. Yay! Hey, good evening, guys. So good to be here with you, Dr. Montgomery. <laughs> Dr. Knox. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Master Lester. <laughs> yeah. And, and Hillary, is, I just really appreciate you guys having me on tonight. So. Well, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> uh, so you, you want a little background, you said, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, sure. So uh, I, I grew up in southern Indiana, uh, where, as you said, I just recently returned to. I've been gone for whew, over, we figured, over 20 years. Uh, I uh, had been living in uh, central Indiana, around the Indianapolis metro region for uh, many years. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've been a music student since I before I could even read a book I was reading music my parents are uh, church musicians my mom has been a church pianist for over 60 years and my dad was typically the song leader uh, so I was kind of born in, yeah born into it and um, and so you know I grew up uh, piano lessons with my elementary piano teacher Sarah Circus Getter a graduate of IU and was in band uh, music was just uh, I was just there when the doors open and there when they closed for band, marching band, concert band, you know, <laughs> high school musicals. I grew up in a, I was just really fortunate to grow up here uh, in around Santa Claus, Indiana. Yes, that's a town, Santa Claus. <laughs> Everything is Christmas 24, 7, 365. And oh so my. it's it's really like, it's just like a, it's almost like, it's just this really magical place. It sounds corny, but it's just a really magical place to grow up and I just music in um, in the 80s and 90s here band was just really thriving and really important and um, you know I just was really I was just really privileged honestly to grow up in a very musical community where band and the arts were very were just as important as sports you know in in, in my wow. eyes it, it, maybe not everybody would agree with that but I mean I felt that way I felt like I belonged in a place and music was just um, that I was just one of those kids I was just an average student but music is where I thrived and and lived you know and um, you know my story I, I did go to college right out of high school it, it gets a little complicated after that but long story short I um, my husband and I were married and we had a family and I, I never really actually finished college at the typical college age my kids were probably in kindergarten and first grade, and um, I had been teaching private piano for years. I had my own studio, making a great living, but man, I just all of a sudden, I, you know, I just really had that, 
feeling of loss, like I didn't finish. Like I, I, I had dreamed of being a conductor since I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. That was my goal. I wanted. I, I attended my first Evansville Philharmonic Orchestra as a field trip in grade school. And when I saw that conductor, I was like, I came home to my mom and I said, I, that's that's what I'm supposed to do. I want to be a conductor. I mean, I just fell in love. I I don't even think I heard the music. My eyes never left him. <laughs> and you know, I I studied drum major and you know did all of that stuff. And I I just um, but I just some a few things got in the way. And you know, I eventually I was like that pull to that desire to finish. I just told my husband after the kids went back to school, I said, I think I want to, I think I'm going to go back to school. And we were living in Indianapolis and I contacted, I don't know, I was probably 28, 29 years old at the time. And I contacted the University of Indianapolis and they just accepted me with open arms. And the, the band director at the time, James Spinazzola at University of Indianapolis just absolutely took me under his wing and they did everything in their power to to just make give me the best education that I could to finish my bachelor and I, I finished a bachelor of uh, music performance in tuba I'm, I'm wow tuba. yeah <laughs> I was a tuba player I, I'm just a weirdo I mean it's just it's gonna get it's just gonna keep getting weirder and weirder so just hold on I love um, it. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's not weird. It's great. So, you know, I, I, and then I also had a concentration in composition. I had always wanted to compose, but um, I never, although I was in a really musical environment, I just didn't kind of get into that composition circle at a young age. I wanted to, but I just, I, I have to be honest, and, and I've been pretty open about this. I didn't really know when I was 18 years old that women could compose. I know that sounds crazy. Oh, you're raising your hand. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I had the same I, thing. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I just, it's a rural community, and I never, I, and it's not any fault of my teachers. It's just the way it was in the 80s and 90s, I think, for me anyway, here. And when I got to college, I saw, I was like, hey, wait, wait, I, I could compose, you know. And um, when I went to University of Indianapolis, I, I was pushing 30, and I had never written a piece, but I really, really wanted to try. And he, again, Dr. John Berners took, you know, I told him, I went to him, and I said, you know, I'd really, I'd really like to take some composition lessons. And he didn't even blink. Let's go. You know, we started that semester, I believe, and I've been composing ever since and I, I did get a concentration in composition as well with my performance degree um, just almost went took maybe a year off and went right down the road in Indianapolis to Butler University and um, there I got a double master's in instrumental conducting and composition and I studied them concurrently um, it was a little rough but I mean I wanted I didn't I, I, I <laughs> Uh, I didn't, I just couldn't give either one of them up, you know, I, yeah. I, I think I just always wanted to um, just know music so deeply that I just wanted to know everything there is to know about music. Now that's never going to happen, but that's what <laughs> I, I really honestly felt that way. I, I don't know if it was that long break I took, but I just had this voracious appetite to just learn every single thing I could possibly could try to learn and so that was why I stayed in both at Butler now um, when I went to get my PhD I kind of I sort of felt like I needed to make a decision <laughs> you know <laughs> one or the other you know like was, PhD. <laughs> I, I, by that time I was getting a little older and it was getting hard to juggle that much activity and so um, you know I, I conducting was always my my heart and my passion and I knew deep down inside that I'd always have an opportunity con to conduct you know if it came about and I knew with the uh, education that I received from uh, Professor Colonel Michael Colburn at Butler University and Dr. Spinozola at UND I knew I had the conducting skills that I could take that and and carry on in the future. So I then met Dr. Dinos Constantinides at Louisiana State University when I was looking for uh, graduate school for my PhD. And once again, um, I was just I was just blessed. He just took me in and uh, heard my story, saw my music that I had composed, 
and even though that despite that it took me anyway <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know and that he just um opened up a world to me in composition uh you know he's um at the he's at the tender age of what 91 now and so uh you know he has he knows everything there is to know about composing in the music business and the music world and even though we only spent three years together, it was three years that shaped and changed my life uh, forever, and I'm just really grateful for that. And the whole faculty at Louisiana State University, Bill, you know this, is just... Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I had experiences I could have never dreamed of there, and so, um, yeah... So that that's kind of in a in a very wrapped up long nutshell, you know. That's that's <laughs> how that's how I got to to where I'm at today. Um, and now, you know, I maybe not a, I'm not this as young as maybe some of the other students, you know. I'm kind of, but you know, I'm just sort of in the same boat, you know. I have I've had all these years and wonderful experiences that I just can't even wrap up in one podcast, but. You know, now I'm just um, learning all, taking all of those experiences, and now I just look forward to, you know, continuing to find ways to help help whoever I can help with any knowledge I gained, you know, and pass mm -hmm. that knowledge on because that's that's what we do, you know. We just want to pass it on to the next generation so it continues. So. You, you know, I still remember the first day I walked into Dino's office. You know, and he's got all those pictures with him, and there's like, uh, what Cesar Chavez and uh, oh yeah, John Cage, jo Shostakovich, John yeah. Cage, these people he knew personally, and you're just like, right, <laughs> so just so overwhelming. Yeah, he just uh, all the pictures on his wall of signed by you know, Stravinsky, I mean, you know, he, all the, all the years at LSU that they had the contemporary music festivals and that's the, all these musicians, from, renowned musicians from all over the world came. And I mean, you know, that, that energy carries over, you know, into the, into the generations and the decades in the future. And, oh, just unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, it is. He's got, it he's is. got great stories. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary, do you, you have a question you want to ask? I think you guys have sold me on LSU. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I was thinking. Um, I kind of wanted to circle back. To just that moment you said where you're like, I didn't know women could be composers, and I just yeah. that hit me hard because I totally I had the same revelation. I, um, a little bit about me is I did engineering for my first, um, stint into college. I made it about a year and then I went, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do music. Um, but while I was doing engineering, I was like Googling what else I could do, um, instead of doing my physics homework. <laughs> and I remember like finding, um, that a girl. girl. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, calc or, or <laughs> what else can I do? Procrastination rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but I remember finding um, composition at the University of Montana and just feeling like really, really stupid and being like, how did I not know I could go into this? And how did I not know this was a thing that people were still like learning? And it was just, I think yeah. I grew up in such a small community that mm -hmm. in Western Montana music is somebody, somebody playing a fiddle at the rodeo or you're singing the national anthem at a football game yeah. or it's definitely not as robust as I would say the the middle part of the country and well, I grew up in Texas and band was everything in Texas but I moved to Montana yeah. when I was 12 and it was nothing <laughs> it was we were super lucky to have a pet band seven oh. through five in our tiny school and yeah. I just I don't know that hit me hard I was like oh man a I didn't know that you could still do this and b I didn't know that women could still do this <laughs> mm. yeah well you know I had uh, my two ba high school band directors Gary Aarons and John Heineman um Hi, John. We just talked yesterday. It was great. Uh, you know, he, they they were so great for me. But, I mean, I was honest with them. I really thought I wanted to be a conductor. And, I mean, composing never, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say it never came to mind. But, I mean, I guess I just, I'm like you. I just, I, I don't remember, honestly, what I thought until I got to college the first time. And that was when I was like, oh, wait a minute. Uh, you know, this is a thing. Like, this is possible or this is a thing. 
or, you know, uh, I don't remember if I saw uh, other women in the program or I saw um, music from a woman or something. I, I, can't, I wish I could put my finger on what caused me to think that. But I just remember, um, you know, probably going to a seminar or something. And, yeah, it hit me like, duh, you know, uh, <laughs> why not, you know. And so, yeah, that's – but you know what concerns me is – uh, I through my project, uh, nevertheless she composed. There's so many of us, uh, Hillary. I'm not. I don't want to out you. I don't know what no, how no. old you are. You know what age you are. But I mean, it's it's like we're we're still he, we. A lot of us felt that way, and then unfortunately, we're still kind of meeting some young students yeah. that are still not sure about that, and that. That to me is kind of tragic. I, I hope it's getting fewer and far between with social media and just more uh, communication. But I don't know. I'm still meeting some students that are like, "Yeah, I had no idea that I could compose." You know, so we gotta we gotta work on that. <laughs> yeah. So. No, but, that's that's how it was for me. I I graduated yeah. with my bachelor's in 2015. Um, so even then I was like, I mean, I was the only female, there was a, a gal two years ahead of me, hi Emily, <laughs> um, who she was the only girl for her age in that program. And then I was two years below her. And then yeah. I think there was a couple ladies below me, but I don't know if they, they followed it all the way through. Yeah. And they were like, you're She's the just a baby, child. Liz. She's just a baby. <laughs> I know. I'm the young <laughs> But see, that's that's even more concerning. You know what I mean? Like it's. But I think you know. I I, I really believe that you know it's just going to take some time, and a lot of us do believe that. And it, and I think it, you know, it is getting better. But um, yeah, yeah I know, I know, I know. So I hope, I hope for yeah the next future generations. I'm like, okay, the work we do today will yes. spread to them, and then they'll realize. Yeah. Hey, women can do this. You can compose A and B. It doesn't matter what gender you are. <laughs> right, right, and yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that document. I'm okay. I'm really excited about the document. Like I remember when you told me what you wanted to do, and I was just like, oh, it's so cool. You know, yeah. it's just such a such a valiant idea. You know, I've heard well, of because you had said that there was someone else who had one sim like something yeah. kind of like that, right? Well, okay, so when I was at Butler um, in Indianapolis, Dr. James Briscoe uh, was the music, prof uh, his music history professor there, and he um, has one of the more prominent uh, anthologies of women composers, and uh, boy, here goes my, here goes my memory. Um, I can't remember exactly the year that it was published. I'm trying to remember the year it was published, early 2000s, I believe. And so, I mean, it's 2020. I mean, you're talking, I, I'm pretty sure it was like something like at least 15 years since this anthology had been published. And it's great. I mean, when I, when I was in, when he was such a champion, he, he is just such an advocate for women composers, much like uh, Dinos is, you know, he, he just, that was his passion. He wrote the anthology. He was always talking about women composers. He included them in his studies. And that was where um, there. That was one moment. And I have to back up at University of Indianapolis. I have to give props to Dr. Rebecca Sorley. Mm -hmm. She is. Uh, she has many titles there, but she was a, a piano professor at the time, and she was doing uh, PowerPoint presentations and like lecture recitals of uh, music by women composers. And I mean. Again, I was getting familiar with women composers, but I mean, this is kind of, uh, let's see, that would have been like 2009-ish, yeah, about 2009, and so we're at, you know, we're at 10, 11 years ago, I suppose, and I mean, I was just kind of getting young into the whole comp composition scene anyway, and oh, it just lit, like I just really got passionate about that not just because I was a woman composer but I think it was again like Hillary you know just coming from that place of like finding this these new open doors for me you know and it really lit a fire under me and um 
So when I got to Butler and read that anthology, I thought I, I thought it was really great. But I thought, oh, I love to write. Uh, I'm not. I don't wax very eloquently on speech, but I I've <laughs> always loved to write. That that was my passion. Even when I was in high school, it, other than music, that was the only thing that I that I was ever really kind of recognized for was I, I had a writing ability, and so um, oh, I just really dreamed of writing a book. Well, uh, fa then even at Butler, I knew what my PhD thesis was going to be during my master's. Like I knew there was no, and if you if they would have said no, I probably would have transferred. You know that's how that's how committed I was. I didn't have the title. <laughs> I, I didn't come up with the title until I got to LSU, but I knew I wanted to write a, an anthology. But technology kept you know this whole the whole online thing kept growing i mean it just, the the social media presence just got stronger and stronger the video things just got stronger and stronger so i mean printed book is great and yes i do want to do the printed anthology but then when i got to lsu and i thought well this probably needs to have a stronger online presence than anything and i said how i, I sat down i thought well how can i make this like hopefully someday a study resource, um, you know, for students to access online, you know, wow. and for women, uh, you know, and then also the anthology is great, but if you go back through there, a lot of those women composers are gone, you know, they're yeah. passed away. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, we cannot forget about our pioneers. We have got to give them their due. But mm -hmm. I was like, I really want to we're alive right now we're here I like living in the moment a little and I was like what if we just focus mostly on living women composers while we're doing it you know and I mean right. the you know I'm not inventing anything new I mean podcasts interviews there's been a million of them but you know um I had a lot of decisions to make with this project uh, nevertheless she composed and I, I tell you what, relationships mean a lot to me. I have built so many wonderful relationships through music, and I could, you know, I started to make it a really academic sort of, it was supposed to be my dissertation, right? So it needed to be academic. But I decided I was just going to go out on a limb, and I kind of made it more biographical in nature, you know, and, and opened it up to, I don't ask them questions. You know, we literally have a format of past, present, and future, and maybe I'll throw in a few questions scattered throughout as the as it comes up, but otherwise I just let them talk, you know, and oh, the information that is coming out of these women is just so much better than if I had, you know, scripted a bunch of you know, really stale questions and whatever. I just let them talk. I took a little flack of over that <laughs> for my dissertation, you know, because you lose a little bit of the academic quality. But, you know, I think LSU is so open and so uh, forward thinking that they were able to see my vision, you know, for that it wasn't just a dissertation. This is a lifelong endeavor. Um, I hope for me, you know, that's what my plan is. And as long as there's women composers, I have plenty of people to interview. <laughs> so oh, definitely, definitely. Love yeah, that. I will never, ever get through everyone. It's just, um, you know, it's just the way it is. Uh, so that's a great problem to have because there are so many living women composers. But, you know, honestly, when I even started that, I mean, look how much has changed since I started the project three years ago. I yeah. mean, now we're talking, we, back then, we were, three years ago, we were just complaining that women composers weren't getting enough um, exposure. But now, you know, we've got, you know, we, we want to get everyone included, you know. Um, so I feel like, like maybe I was a little too close-ended on my part, only focusing on women composers. But, you know, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I, I even, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I, maybe there, I've even thought, well, nevertheless, um, they composed, you know, whether it's, de, de, yeah. uh, you know, um, based their ethnic or backgrounds or social economic backgrounds. I mean, it, it's never ending to what we, what we could do as far as series goes, you know, so, um, I'm trying to not be too hard on myself on that right now because, <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that that was 
just where I was coming from um, starting the the project, and uh, I've just yeah, it's just been a it's been a wonderful. I'm just getting started. I barely scratched the surface. I'm so far behind too. <laughs> but now, but now that my you know it, I, I, now that my PhD is finished and uh, you know I'm kind of getting settled into my new life and everything. I've you know productions started keep, keeps going and everything. So we're we're back on track. But yeah, and you've interviewed people from you know uh, I wouldn't say like small beans but like uh female composers who are really less known all the way up to people like jennifer higdon who's got pieces on uh carnegie hall and all over the world right yeah this i mean this was this is kind of um my passion as well with this project i mean uh, we once again i don't want to forget about our pioneers i don't want to in in but at the same time, um, how can you put this? I mean, the media has a tendency to sometimes gravitate just towards certain composers, you know. And and what we're seeing is like, uh, this is a sensitive subject. But so right. so there was this there was this sort of wave of of orchestras touting that they had, you know, women on their. Uh, playlist for the season but it was kind of like always the same names you know and I mean that's great I'm I don't want to sound ungrateful but Lawrence there's Price and all these other yeah and, and you they're know great but there's others we could include I kind of got I was kind of like you know so basically somebody said well what's your criteria for a composer you know and there was some question about quality of music I said look um, it, it, it just look if the if if she is working on her craft and she is making you can tell that there's an effort there to d diffuse her music and to continue to be a lifelong student you know and work working her composition and trying to make a, a career out of that then that's good enough for me you know, I, who am I to say whether they, you know, that music deserves to be reviewed or anything like that. I have a problem with that because right. I, I just, you know, and I know a few people have snubbed me over that, but I, I really feel that way because, you know, um, education is important and you should learn your craft. If you're going to call yourself a composer, you need to put that effort into. But, you know, everybody, we, we talk about, opportunity and we talk about equality and we talk about this and that well i mean not everybody you know not everyone has the same opportunities you know well for whatever reason and for for them to be discounted just because they don't get reviewed by new york times every other week that's a shame right because there's yes. some great music out there and it's not because they're my friends. I said, well, you just interviewed her because they're your friends. Well, no. I mean, maybe some, but no. I mean, if a woman, con <laughs> I mean, if a woman contacted me, and I mean, she's obviously out there trying to do her craft. I'll interview her. I don't, it, you know. And and, and of course, uh, I'm trying to stay. I am trying to stay sort of in the new music world but even that there's been some there's been some uh genre bending a little already with a couple of the composers and now you've got some uh performance art composers in there and you know there's uh -huh. just so many different things where and when you start putting up walls and barriers and parameters yeah that that doesn't it, it it gets a little messy so yeah so yeah i have people who i've i've had women who you know, have or have had premieres that, but maybe just you know locally or whatever, all the way up to you know like Dr. Higdon and <laughs> who was so nice to to do an interview, and we've had him in between, and so it's just really nice to be able to include such a wide range of composers with such varied backgrounds. Man, what a breath of fresh air! <laughs> so I just really enjoyed hearing your <laughs> your viewpoint because I think. I think there's a nuance to drawing that boundary and you, you draw it so delicately. And I just, I think that it's, it's very thoughtfully drawn is what I'm trying to say, but uh, uh, that's just so empowering to hear. <laughs> well, and you know, we, we need to be an encouragement 
male, female, you know, no matter what color or anything, we, we need to be an encouragement to each other in unity, especially during these times. And we certainly don't need more divisiveness and, you know, drawing the lines and excluding. I mean, that's not what we do in music. Music uh, includes everyone. And we, I think we need to keep that message, even in the academic world, you know, I've seen a lot of changes over the last 20 years, and I know the uh, I know the uh, more mature professors would you know would agree too. But um, I think the more that we just keep that communication open and keep our minds open, where people are coming from, you know, that you you know everybody has something to bring to the table. Every woman composer, every male composer as well, but every woman composer has something to bring to the table, no matter what what background she has or how much, you know, where she's been performed or how many concerts she's been on, you know, so. I, I completely agree. I think it's, you know, everyone should be counted and included and, you know, yeah. shouldn't exclude anybody. So, right. I mean, that's kind of why we created this podcast was to, highlight everybody you know there's so much in the world that people can learn and listen to and absolutely i'm very excited for you guys i can't wait and i was just really excited when you contacted me about this i think it's just a great idea and any anything that opens up more opportunities for learning and you know we learn from each other and and that's i think that's great so yeah. good job for you guys yay <laughs> we're excited to have you <laughs> Or wanted to touch back on um, you were being hard on yourself about only you know starting with women and it's like I I was thinking in my head it was like you you when you open a door and you kind of see the first thing as you walked in and I think for you that probably was female composers and you get in the room and you're like there's so many other minorities in here why don't we put everyone everyone's in this room now and I, I, um, so I, I applaud you for starting and opening that door and yeah um, and you know even in my short time at LSU I I started researching, you know, music by um, African-American composers that I never, ever, no one's ever heard of, you know, and I started, I felt bad for them. And I'm like, oh, they deserve, you know, they deserve, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know and, and there was just so many other things, uh, you know, there's just so many opportunities and, but, oh, there's, I just wish there's more hours in the day. That's the only problem, you know, yeah. <laughs> We'll get there. So, yeah. You can only but, pull so many all-nighters, right? Oh, seriously. <laughs> yeah. You know, I thought I would be done with that finishing your PhD, but I've already <laughs> pulled some all. I've already had to pull some all-nighters after here. I was like, "What is up with that?" I thought those were days were going to be over, but no, they don't end for a musician. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Especially a scholarly musician. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so my question uh, is, um, you have all these interviews. Um, how many interviews were you able to do so far? Oh, well, I mean, let's see. I, I think I, I'm really just getting started. I think I'm up, I have um, maybe 12 or 14. I don't have all those published. I have hours. I mean, I'm honestly, I'm doing all the video editing and all the sound editing. It just, it's a long process. You, you guys are going to know that, you know, from this podcast, so, uh, you know, and so, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, it, I know the last count was 12. I think it might be 14, but I, you should see the list of yeah. names that I have. I've just been collecting names as women email me and, um, you know, I took a break. I did take a break from publishing. You probably noticed there's been a break since the last composer published, but that was just simply, I was finishing my PhD. I'm going to say this really quietly. There was an intellectual property scare, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, so I won't get into all that, but you know about intellectual property. So I kind of just sort of took a little hiatus this last year, you know, from publishing anything. But now that I'm actually, you know, finished with my PhD and moved on with that, then I'm really, I like already started back in with the um, editing and get, you know, working on the, the next set of um, videos to actually post online and, and put out to the public so uh and yeah and then um i'm now since i have a little more time i'm concurrently trying to uh, 
continue the printed aspect. So I'm so what so the video interviews are posted online, and then I take those and transcribe them word for word into print, and that would be the printed resource for the anthology eventually. But that's that's kind of down the road, you know. I'd hope to have something by now, but, you know, trying to finish a PhD and do all of that at the same time was just, you know, and take care of a family was, <laughs> you know, it, it, like I said, not enough hours in the day, but I'm, yeah, we're, we're, we're making progress and looking, looking forward to it. Oh, I should say all on my area. own, uh, I should say Dr. Eric Sheffield, he did oh. give me, he gave me some, ex, some uh, assistance, so I do have to give him a shout out, um, that he was a big help and during part of the process when I was working on my uh, deal there at LSU. So cool. thank you, Dr. Sheffield. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what was your favorite interview that you've done so far? Oh my goodness. I know it's a well, tough question. Cause that, they're all really great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I know I'm going to, I'm going to have to take the wimpy way out of this one. You know what? I mean, <laughs> The great thing about these interviews, I, I can't say, it's hard to even say I had a favorite. I mean, because every single interview, it blows me away, like, how much diversity each woman brought. But yet, there's unity in some of the answers, you know? There's so many things that we agreed upon, you know? And, um, I, I mean, well, take for, so my friend... She is my friend. We we worked on our masters together at Butler, Amber Beams, and she's has her masters in composition from Butler. I mean, she writes for handbell choir. I mean, who does that? You know, but we're talking new music, like new con new contemporary classical music for handbell choir, and she knows everything there is to know about handbell choir. Okay. Wow. So I mean, she's fast. I mean, but. And she's had some great success. She's had some performances and you know at universities and stuff and everything. But I'm, but yet you know she gets little com exposure as a composer. But I mean I I love that interview because she, you know she if if, if a student wants to know about handbells that's who they need to get to know. You yeah, contact definitely. Amber. But then you know and then Dr. Gibson at LSU. I mean you know her her years of expertise in academia. And just her background and her insights and studying as a student and then as being a professor, you know, and I mean, the, the amount of knowledge these women bring to the table blows my mind, you know, it's just almost overwhelming. And Dr. Higdon, I mean, the, the fact that these women are so open and honest and candid about their lives, that's what, that's my favorite part, you know. Dr. Higdon, she was just so uh, helpful about just that, the professional side of being a, a, such an active composer, you know, she's, well, she's the most performed woman composer, living woman composer right now in, in the world, I believe, is her title, and I mean, you know, for her to sit down and just give us a look inside her world so that we can learn about self-publishing, she, she talks about self-publishing, and she talks about, you know, just building those relationships with conductors and musicians, you know, um, I mean, it's hard to say I have a favorite person, because, I mean, you just, it's just, everyone has something, you know, right. that, that I just fell in love, I fall in love with it each time I work with these videos, you know, so. Well, I definitely want to include, like, links to the people that you mentioned, too, so that way, if people are like, oh, who's, who's this Amber Beams or who's, you know, yeah. they well, can go and they can figure that out. That's exactly what I did with Nevertheless. Um, you know, I just, anything we mentioned through the interviews, if it has an online presence, I just put the link below the YouTube video or on the website. And then that way, you know, if there's, uh, it, it, be, it really showed its, um, value when it came to like schools and festivals you know because okay. if they if the composer talked about a certain festival that they were involved in then there's a link to that festival or that organization you know and um or even the school they attended you know i mean i it, it's it was really a really a valuable thing you know 
for me to even have. You know, I learned so much right. through those interviews. I mean, there were just things I'd never heard of, you know? And oh, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it really, I learned more than anybody. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's great, so. Uh, so then I guess, who might have been the hardest for you to get a hold of? Because you see, um, you have like a, a thing where they can submit to you, but were there anyone that you were like, yeah, I really want to be I this mean, person, so I'm going to throw yeah. out a Hail Mary? Yeah, I don't want to, yeah, this, um, I tell you, there was a composer, oh dear, um, there was a composer that Dinos really wanted me to include, and she, um, here's, here's what happens, you know, when they are a little older or have some health issues, there's some women composers I really wanted to interview, but, you know, not up on the Zooming and the Skyping and all that <laughs> stuff, you know. I did, yeah. I did travel, I did travel a fair bit to, so far, to interview some of the composers. Um, have done a lot of Skype, you know, did some Skype when, when needed and everything. Um, but I'd say that kind of, that, that's been a little bit of a challenge for some of the older composers because, you know, they wanted, you know, just, just being able to get to them. And she was in Austria and, and honestly, we had it all worked out to Skype, but then she just wasn't physically, she just wasn't up for it. You know, uh, that was yeah. disappointing. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of, kind of, that was one, that's been one thing that I sort of ran into with the older composers, you know, and that's, that's also a shame, uh, cause you run out of, I mean, I don't want to be morbid, but you run out of time, you know, you're going to run out of time to, we're going to run out of time to talk to these women. I mean, they've, they've given thousands of interviews before, you know, um, this, I, I guess that biographical candidness, so, um, what what happened with Dr. Higdon? Hope she hopefully she doesn't mind. I mentioned this, but I mean, we talked about. She even mentioned we talked about things she's never talked about before in any of the hundreds of interviews that she's given. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that opening that door up and letting them free associate talk, you know, free associative kind of conversation, allows them to sort of glean memories that maybe they wouldn't have gleaned before we talked more about her conducting <laughs> she actually <laughs> had a stint of conducting and she had never really had the chance to talk about those times uh that much and so that was fun i mean it, we yeah. saw a side of dr higdon that maybe we didn't wouldn't have gotten to see otherwise you know and i love that you know i want to see i want to see a side of these composers and i want them to feel comfortable sharing. Uh, I, like I said, I took a little bit of guff, uh, a few maybe questioned me, it, it, it does it demean these women a little bit because these interviews can get a little fluffy. I, I took offense to that because uh, we we read the sexy letters of Beethoven or Mozart or whatever you know, right, and, right. and we 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 read these letters about them going using the the facilities and stuff like that, and these very candid moments in their lives, and we read those and, and nobody cares. I mean, it's but but then a woman opens up about her background and her life and where she came from, and all of a sudden it's uh, demeaning. Well, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not a controversial person. And I'm, you, you know, if you know me, I'm just like, go with the flow, Liz, you know, but I will speak up and say, uh, it does not demean just because a woman maybe has fond memories or emotions or an, you know, attachment to her composition, that's personal. And she has a right to share that without lo being looked upon as non-academic, you know, because oh, we yeah. start, we certainly don't have that problem with the great, comp the ma great male composers and looking back at their biographical autobiographies that some of them are just ridiculous, you know, that oh, they've, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. I, I read, I am a big biographical reader of, com of composers and I'm just telling you, I've read some autobiographies that would, I'm just like, are you joking? You know, so yeah. <laughs> 
I, I'm not going to accept, I'm not going to really accept that. <laughs> uh, you know, if we want to, I think it's good for us to share about our backgrounds and where we came from and how we got where we are, you know, because um, that I, I think it is it's important, and I think it's going to be encouraging for other young women um, that might come across the videos who were like us and didn't know they could compose. You know, I think like you're allowing people to express their passion, and I think that's what's incredibly powerful because when men express their passion, it's it's odd at like oh he's expressing himself, but when typically when women do that, it's Oh, well, she's really emotional. And uh, I, I know. I, yeah. But I'm not I, saying everyone has that viewpoint, but I, no, uh, that but criticism it, comes up quite a bit. It's like women are, I mean, music is passionate. Like it's, it has a passion to it. it. It absolutely is. And, and, you know, I mean, look, I, I've spent, I've spent my days in academia. I get it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I get it. And I'm not trying to discount anything we do because no, I take that seriously. I, I nearly lost my life a couple of times trying to get through school. I mean, it was, you know, it was very, very hard for me, um, raising a family. I, I had a lot of privileges, you know, and, and, but there was struggle and I get that the, I do not want to discount anything from academia. I always high it in the, I hold it in the highest regard. I always will. I don't want to diminish what we do because it is important and it matters. You know, um, a lot of the world doesn't think, you know, what we do anymore matters. They think, they look at me like I have, you know, aliens coming out of my head when I tell them <laughs> what I do, you know, they're like, oh, okay. I mean, well, that sounds like a nice hobby. I'm like, oh, you know, the hobby uh, I know it still happens. It still happens. You know, well, isn't that cute? You know, well, no. So well, yeah. Have a real job, so. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. So I do take it seriously, <laughs> but um, I, I just don't, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to buy that, that these, candid interviews are going to diminish these women's careers. I think it, I, I just can't, you know, just yeah. can't. The more I know about a composer, the more I fall in love with them, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, I do love their music first, but then when I get to know, even if they're gone for a hundred years, you know, the more I get to know them on a deeper level and what drove them, maybe I've always been called saccharine and sugary and too <laughs> uh, nurturing. Those are some of the words that have been used with me. And I'm, you know, well, I suppose, but I mean, you know, I'm, it's made me passionate about what I do and about my music. So I guess whatever gets you there, you know, that's, <laughs> that's what you got to do, you know, yeah, <laughs> well, I think that human quality is so empowering for women because I think, or at least me personally, I think, um, as I, I look at, you know, my male counterparts that are, you know, male composers, you think, they're on such a high pedestal and I, you don't quite realize that they had lives too. And so I think women are placed maybe even higher where they have to shine on this, this perfect level to get yeah. across. But I, I think when you can add that human element of like, you know, they're, they're people too. They have these problems. They, and they can speak candidly and freely. Like that's just as a little girl, I would have just like ate that up and loved I know. it. <laughs> well, there, you've got two sides to every fence. Somebody, somebody's listening to this podcast and say, you don't need to know anything about my life to appreciate my music. Yeah. You know, it's all about the music and nothing else, you know. And then there's another side of the fence of someone, you know, male, female, uh, llama. It doesn't matter. It, they're <laughs> they, they're going to they're gonna hear this and say, you know, I, I connect with that. And and. Whether you don't connect with it or you do connect with it, I mean, you know, I would say the people that don't connect with it, then they probably need a podcast that talks about, you know, the square root of the diminished seventh chord, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I'm just making stuff, <laughs> you know, uh, some kind of training how are we using yeah, and, and you know what that's great that's great if transformational theory is what gets you out of bed in the morning i say i am happy for you and i say go for it you know you go transform whatever you're transforming but i mean if 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 music is a connection for you I, it was the only way um i you know i'm not i i, I didn't 
I don't know if I had social struggles or anything, but it was just the way, it's just kind of the way I find to connect, you know, in this world. And, uh, and these, uh, when I, when I hear about someone's story, you know, it just helps me to connect to them. And I, I have to say that any musician worth their salt that has experienced any sort of, uh, whatever you want to define as success has had to have relationships along the way, whether you want to admit it or not. Someone, you had to have gotten some kind of relationship unless you just paid them a buttload of money, you know, to, to perform your music and you just never, ever, you know, interacted with them. I mean, but you had to have some kind of relationship. And I think that was my motivation, just to, as much of a motivation for that project as anything is, you know, building those relationships and helping other people find a way to build a relationship with those composers. So here's one that um, I thought of, and at first I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to ask this, and then I was like, you know what, I might as well just throw it out there and see what happens. So uh, if there was any female composer from throughout history that you would have interviewed, you could have interviewed. Oh, dear. I know it's a it's a big oh, question. That's, I'm, my heart is pounding already. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, any any from any any time period. Any time period. <sighs> Man. Doesn't just have to be on you know I, on being in or anything. So. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. I tell you what. I. So there was a there was a time where, I really kind of was interested in composers that came from war-torn countries mm, okay. and and what they were going like what music could we have possibly lost during those times not just from like a building burning but I mean what what maybe a composer wrote during that time okay like our coronavirus compositions right now what what's going to pop up here in the next six months to a year you know what's going to come out of this from us as composers, or did we lose something while we were all just kind of under this duress? You know what I mean? So I'm afraid I, I can't necessarily give you a name, but I can tell you I was, I noticed that during times of war, at least in, in my limited research and just coming through general reading, I don't see a lot of women. Now somebody's going to email me. Oh, you need to look up this composer. Great. <laughs> Email me, you know. Yes, good, good. Give us some yeah, more. that that's what I want. But I, I'm not seeing I mean, we hear about Messian and his, you know, court type in the time. You know, we talk about those things during war and, you know, in prison and, you know, just working with what you have. I just don't hear a lot of that about women composers like from the you know, and I'm sure they are, but in my in my experience, I'm just kinda curious. I wish I could have a name, but I mean, I'm just curious about what composers we might have missed. You know, women composers we may have missed during World War One, maybe during World War Two over, you know, in Europe or something that just didn't make the cut, if you know what I mean. Right, right. Didn't get in the canon, didn't get mentioned in the history books. And I mean, you know, there has to be someone out there but I, I guess I'm just kind of like interested in the underdog, you know, who didn't get in the history books. And, and so I guess that'd have to be my answer. I just wish I could, you know, find, and I know there's plenty, there's, there's, I don't know if you've ever looked at like the list of women composers, even on just Wikipedia. I mean, it's, there's a lot, I mean, but it's just, it's, you know, just going through there and seeing like what they're finding their repertoire, if it was even accessible and things like that, that interests me. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. whole other anthology, though. Because <laughs> 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 that I, I most those women would be primarily probably gone by now, at least definitely World War One, you know. So, um, but anyway, yeah, when I was at LSU, we had to go to Memorial Library where they have the archives of, you can, you know, get a box of scores that have been there forever. And I mean, I came across, just randomly came across, uh, now she was maybe more of a pianist, but there was uh, Basil Barris, and he was 
po quite possibly the only first and only African American man to have a have published music, but he was still a slave wow. at, at the time. Yeah, I mean, you know, and so I, I just researched and researched, and there, there was a professor, I think she was at Louisiana Tech or over in Lafayette or somewhere in that area, she had written about him in a book, you know, in her book, and mentioned him, but all of these composers, he was from New Orleans, you know, and he was working for a music publicist. He was working for a music publicist, but he was still registered, from my understanding and my reading, he was still technically registered as a slave in, in the 1800s, but he actually wow. had some piano music, and it was kind of like they had gone over to France during this time to study music over there, and then they ended up coming back to New Orleans. And even this woman... Sorry, your name just escaped me, my mind again. But she, she had, you know, she was studying composition in France and came to, you know, they all kind of, New Orleans was a hot spot for that um, to come back to. And, you know, it's just stuff like that. I mean, it, you come across those gems sometimes and it's the same, got to be the same way with women composers, you know. Just, he just kind of got lost in the mix, you know, or... For whatever reason, you know, but I uh, would love, it would be great, somebody, you know, it'd be great to do a concert of just music like that, you know, that, oh, yeah, yeah, in all honesty, I, I feel like maybe one of his piano pieces, I read that might have been included on either an LSU concert or something, or a New Orleans, University of New Orleans concert one time, you know, as part of a special thing, but, yeah, so... Yeah, if it could just be more standard rather than just a special edition performance. Well, you know, yeah. we're talking. But that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> that my head. Yeah, I know. See that it just it just <laughs> keeps going and going. I mean, that's the big thing right now. Everybody wants, you know, like with courses at university, you know, more inclusion, you know, and and um, that's a big deal right now. I mean, I I have to admit, I didn't really see that coming ten years ago either. You know, I mean, we right. talked some about it, but I mean, as far as to how big the push is now with all of the unrest and the, you know, just that, that push for inclusion, I mean, uh, when, you know, when you're preparing your syllabus, it, you have to, th you know, it's a whole new ball game to be think to think about, which I think is great. Yeah. You know, I, I get tired of talking about the same composers all the time. Now, I have to say I'm on the side of, I don't think we should cut the greats out i'm a little old-fashioned in that way but why can't we add to that you know mm -hmm. yeah i don't think we should i don't think we should get away, away from it completely but we should certainly could you know add a little uh, balance it out maybe a little more so no i dig it <laughs> I dig it yeah <laughs> it's all good i would take that class the not so known contemporaries of the greats <laughs> that well, you don't know about. I mean, I would really enjoy that. <laughs> well, and maybe and maybe that's the answer. You know, maybe I, I understand as a professor that, you know, you have you you've got benchmarks and you've got goals and you know a student needs to know this and this and this, but maybe maybe we do just have more added curriculum and I know that's hard too on budgets and you know more staff and more time I mean I get it I get it you know but we got we have to do better and I mean you know and I think it's only going to strengthen any program that is able to invest in that or you know takes the time but again funding all of that boring all of that boring red tape stuff that I don't want to talk about either I mean it gets in the way you know but I'm a realist I do know that a, a, a musical utopia sounds great but a musical <laughs> utopia costs money so it's a vicious it's a vicious cycle <laughs> Uh, so for all the for all the professors uh, that have been in the game for a long time, rolling their eyes, I hear you and I feel your pain. <laughs> We're listening. We know. <laughs> so I guess I only have one last question, um, and I think you kind of hit on it pretty much the whole interview, uh, and just with this, with your with nevertheless she composed. Uh, what role uh, do you kind of expect women to play in the future of 
music and classical music specifically? Is it going to be like a like um, like a tidal wave kind of situation going on? Where with this and with other things like what's going on with Rob Deemer or um, other programs like what San Francisco Conservatory is doing now with certain uh, commissions for African Americans and things. Yeah. You see just like this tidal wave of change and this is just another asset to that. Yeah. See, I, I honestly like with, um, well, when I believe right around the same time I started Nevertheless She Composed, uh, Rob Deemer and the, uh, sorry, Composers Database, Database Institute, you know, I, I did not spit that out correctly. You know what I mean. <laughs> I love you. I love that project. It changed my life. Um, but, you know, when it first started, it was the Women Composers Database. That's, that was the first title, and that was the running title of it when I started Nevertheless She Composed because it was one of the first things that I gravitated to and, and cited right off the bat. I was so excited, but look look what it changed. Within a year or two, it was no longer the Women Composers Database. It was the, uh, the database for composer diversity, you know, mm -hmm. and um, somebody give me the correct title. I'm sorry, Rob. I love you. <laughs> I mean, I know we don't really know each other personally, just online, I, but I do love the project. I'm just getting a little senile <laughs> in, my, in, my, in my advanced age. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, I think, I think that <laughs> that's why I feel a little obsolete. I'm not going to change the name of Let Nevertheless She Composed, and I'm not going to change the MO. I mean, um, it is what it is, and I think it's going to still have value, you know. Uh, but I do believe that it's the it's much bigger than that now, you know. We're we we're trying to see composers for who they are, not what they are, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I and like I said, I opened just Hillary. That was a great way to put it. I opened a door, and I kind of hugged the first thing I saw, <laughs> you know, when I walked through it. I mean, but that you got to start somewhere, and that's just where I that's just where I started, you know. But I, I hope. Uh, now it's even been raised, you know, uh, the the ethnic, you know, the ethnic concerns of the women that I'm gonna, you know, interview and make sure that I'm gonna include. Well, I don't. It doesn't really have anything to do with any of that for me. My my, like I said earlier, my uh, goals are simply: Are you working on your craft? I'm, you know, if I'm if 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 it looks like all the composers I've interviewed so far are white, well, they're just the first ones that, that interviewed, you know, like contacted me. I mean, it had nothing to do with my decision of who I'm including. I'm just trying to get through the list of names, you know. But, I mean, absolutely, if I see that, you know, if I saw that it was live study, I mean, it has nothing to do with, you know, like trying to balance it out. We want, we just want to be inclusive, you know. Um, but uh, that tidal wave thing, really we the last three years that women's movement you know of calling for composers or for orchestras to be more inclusive for women that's where it started it, that's where it began and I believe that that's what kicked off this larger inclusivity you know uh, push for everybody, so we have, you know, it's it was a good thing, even though it could be obsolete already. It was still a good catalyst to open up other doors to inclusivity. So no, I don't, I don't think it's a, it's um, obsolete. I think yeah, it's you know what I mean. It's essential. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean, though. I mean, uh, we're we're getting into even more complicated social uh, oh, considerations yeah. now, and. Um, you know it, that that's that's all I mean by that is it's just a lot more complicated than just featuring women composers and I feel bad for the orchestras I mean you know once again I, I don't know I, I don't know if I see a lot of intentional malice or anything it's just the you know you do things the way they've always been done and I mean um, and I think I've seen uh, looking at things from a conductor slash composer side, I try to keep my foot on both in both doors a little. And I, I've seen an effort on the orchestras somewhat, you know, but I, I mean, it's complicated. 
It's just, right. you know, it's just complicated because I think as mu per composers and performing musicians, we just want the problem to be fixed right away. But I also understand how an orchestra works from behind the scenes. And I know that it's a lot more complicated than that, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not the way I want it to be. And I'm not saying it, it's right, but, you know, it, it's just complicated. And unfortunately, I, let's just be straight. A lot of it boils down to money. Yeah. I mean, it's really what it boils down to. If, if an orchestra, I really believe an orchestra had unlimited resources, they probably would include all the repertoire they could, you know. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a catch-22, you know. Yeah. So I, I do try to see everybody's side of the story. I think there are two sides. Not everybody agree with that, but, you know. And it's uh, so Rob Deemer's the founder and director of the Institute for Composer Diversity. Thank you. At least Through someone Fredonian can. University. <laughs> someone can put together a coherent <laughs> sentence around here. Oh no, you're good. You were, you were talking and I googled, so you're good. <laughs> I know it. I know it. Well, I usually I don't have any notes down here. I'm just doing it. I like to try to be candid, but that gets you in a little trouble sometimes too when you, <laughs> when your memory fails you. <laughs> We have Google for us all. Oh, day. that's right. <laughs> yeah. So no, I, I, I do. I mean, I, I would love. I see the things happening. I wish they were happening a little faster and a little more. But now that, and it's so disappointing with this virus nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just so disappointed. We were. I felt like we were really on track to something historical. I'm not saying we're not anymore, but boy, man, has our world been up, turned upside down, you know? <laughs> it's historical I mean, in a new direction. And it's yeah, so, you know, we, we are going to survive. We, we are, new music is being made. Musicians have always found a way. I know it's been hard for everybody. Um, you know, I, I had a Carnegie Hall I was supposed to have a Carnegie Hall premiere in about three weeks, and that's no more, you know, and uh, that's so terribly disappointing, you know, but, I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is, but we just have to, you know, it's, it's a little discouraging as a composer, you know, but we got to keep, you know, just got to keep looking towards the future and, and keep working, so. No, I think it really speaks to the composers during war, and it's like I just I I mean not that we're at war, but we're we're in this massive global isolated event, and I think it really gets your brain turning, and it just I think it really speaks to the power of what you can do when you're put in this box of yeah. all these different pressures placed on you, and it's it's amazing to see people come out and thrive, and come up with new things and yeah. innovate. Yeah, and I think. You know, going back to that whole sugary, saccharine, biographical thing, though, I think it's really important for us to document what we're going through right now with this coronavirus because this is going to change the face of music for years and years to come. Students, probably students, you know, if, if, still, if still here, are 100 years from now are going to be reading about the pandemic of... 2020 and how you know they're going to have essay questions on a history test asking them how did the coronavirus pandemic of 2020 sh you know shape the the scene of, or the lives of composers and performing musicians <laughs> i mean i can totally see that on a, a, a music history entrance exam you know right. and I, I i think it's i think living in the moment and and we have all these ways of documenting um, I think it's just really important for us to take stock of what we're going through right now um, because it will be history, you know. We are making history, and I, I, and, but see, we never think, we never say no. we're making history. Nobody ever says we're making history. I do. Right. I do. I, 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 be, I believe it. You know, when I see something happen, when I saw that push for women composers, I said, this, this is history in the making. And I really, I just see things differently in that aspect. And I believe this coronavirus is history in the making. We want it to be over, and it, you know, it will. But nothing's probably ever going to be exactly the same. But maybe for good reason, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, so I, I just, I, I don't know how to do that very well, other than to make podcasts, do video interviews, and write it down. Yes. <laughs> you know. So, but, you know, 
think about all the interviews that I do from here on out, not one of those interviews probably won't mention the virus or right. the pandemic. I mean, seriously, I, I, I would, it would be hard to imagine that it wouldn't come up somehow, oh, yeah. you know, in, in conversation. I don't want to talk about it, but I mean, it's just reality, <laughs> you know, I'm really done with it. I want to move on, but that's just the way it is, you know, um, that's just how it is. And so, you know, it's history in the making. So. This was just such a great conversation, and I just, I don't know, I feel so inspired after talking with you. Oh, well, me too. I, I mean, it's, a, it's just been a really nice hour with you guys, maybe even a little more, and so I just, I appreciate what you're doing. I think it's, you know, I think it's important, and um, I just wish you guys the best of, of luck, and if there's anything I can do to help, you know how to find me. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. And, you know, thank you so much, Liz, for being on here. It's been a pleasure uh, and an honor, of course. And so glad we were able to talk about Nevertheless She Composed. And Yeah, I guess I didn't, even, I didn't even mention, I'll, it's a shameless plug, but I mean, if you're, if you're oh, interested in the project, uh, never, it's kind of a long thing, but that's what old people do. They make titles too long for the website, but it's Nevertheless <laughs> Nevertheless, she. C- I won't. I won't say www in the front <laughs> about that. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So it, it, it is nevertheless she composed dot org, and so you can see. Uh, I, I have got so much work to do, but I mean, we. You know, there's probably five or six interviews up there, and they're about forty five minutes to an hour piece, and um, you know, it's. It, and there's. I'll have an. I'm gonna. I've got some videos that will be published here in the next, um, probably this month or so. And so, um, and uh, yeah, so just visit that and you can, you know, hear those stories or the, the lives of those composers and learn more about um, through those links, those resources. And, and uh, yeah, and if you're a woman composer, listen to this, uh, contact me, you know. Uh, it might be a little bit before I can get to you because I got a list to go through of names, but I mean, I'm, I'll make it and, um, you know, we'll, um, we'll get you on there and uh, want to hear your story. You know, want to hear about your life and, and your journey, how you, how you made it this far and what you got going on in the future. So, yeah. And I yeah, appreciate and we'll it. Put all, we'll yeah. put all these connections on our thing and uh, that way everyone has a link to it and every, all the social media, we'll put it in there too. So. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Sounds of the World podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll have links to everything in our description. So please follow those links and give them likes and subscriptions. Uh, Like we like to say, the world is a buffet of music, and it's time to eat. So go eat and enjoy and discover. And on that note, I'm going to go have a bite and maybe a beer. Hey, there you go. (laughs) Bye. Bye.